Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to those of you who are brave enough to join us in person. Thank you very much. And welcome to those who are online and are participating virtually in our town hall today. So our town hall is around um, engaging universities in the US and, uh, and the US strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa. We, we know that Sub-Saharan Africa is a very important um, region to the United States and the Biden-Harris administration has now reframed this importance and is giving new voices to, to Africa to ensure that um, we elevate African voices in the most important global conversations. So over the next um, hour and a half, we're going to engage around the, uh, our speaker is going to do some critique on the, um, the strategy. And we're going to look more closely at how we can engage the role of AAP, the Alliance African Partnership, and uh, how we move forward. So I hand it over now to, I should say my name, right? <laughs> Jose Jackson Maleti, I'm the co-director for the Alliance African Partnership in the East Lansing office. And I'll hand it over now to Dr. Titus Awakuche, who will say a few remarks and introduce himself. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Usually in the uh, hybrid world where we have some people in the room and people uh, joining online, we tend to forget the people online. So I'm not going to do that this morning. So to those of you who are joining us online, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to a very engaging session today. My role uh, is to do a brief introduction. I was going to do a long one, but he said make it brief uh, of, uh, of our boss. But before I do that, I should give you a brief, briefer introduction uh, about myself. I'm Titus Awukushe, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Strategic Partnership. Uh, for uh, international studies and programs here at Michigan State University. And it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, my boss and our boss, uh, <coughs> Dr. Uh, Steve Hansen, who is the Associate Provost and Dean for uh, International uh, Studies and Programs here at Michigan State University. If you want to get some details on his, his history and track record and training, uh, if you know how to use Google, you can find that. But some things that you may not know, and I want to mention just a couple of them, uh, is uh, the way that he has led international programs here at Michigan State. Uh, for those who may not know, international studies and programs at Michigan State is a global leader in terms of engagement uh, between the US, the major US university and various regions and people around the world in terms of uh, the things that we do and the kind of strategy and the vision that we have for doing that. Um, one of the things that uh, Steve Hansen has done as uh, Dean and Associate Provost in this role is the vision uh, that he has for international programs. And I'll mention a couple of things here. Uh, for many international programs like ours, they are known for uh, education or study abroad. They are known for support services for international faculty and international students. And we have an excellent one at that too. One thing that they don't do as much or do as well that we are really well known for is our engagement and promotion of research and capacity building around the world. And uh, Steve Hansen has done an excellent job in providing the vision and the leadership for taking us to higher heights in that regard. And two examples of that is his idea of uh, creating uh, partnership platforms uh, that help us to, to uh, have a reason and, and thoughtful way of looking at our engagement in terms of research and capacity building in various regions around the world. And two of those uh, are one, Alliance for African Partnership that is really uh, spearheading the, the event today, and Asia Hub. Uh, I wouldn't say much more or it will become a lengthier uh, uh, introduction. But without much ado, I invite Steve uh, Hansen to come up and give uh, opening remarks. 
Thanks, Titus. I should have been clearer about what short meant. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really excited to be here today and uh, to engage in this conversation about U.S. Africa engagement and where the role of universities going forward. I'm sure many of you are aware of MSU's the rich history and international engagement. In fact, uh, we're excited. This year is our 150th anniversary of the first students, international students coming to Michigan State University. But there was a really a key moment uh, in the 1950s that deserves mention, and that was when President John Hanna committed MSU to be the first public university to engage comprehensively in international work across all three of our missions, research, teaching, and outreach. And he did, he did something more than that, too. He kind of laid the groundwork for how we were going to do that work. And he believed that if we were really going to take the land-grant model and land-grant values to the world, that we needed to have boots on the ground, and that our faculty needed to really understand the people and the problems and the places where they worked. So he began to send our faculty overseas. And there was a, a unique opportunity at the time. Uh, Governor, then, then Governor Ezekiwe, who later became Nigeria's first president, invited Hannah and MSU to come to Nigeria and partner to create the first indigenous university in Nigeria and the first land grant university on the continent. And so from 1960 to 1967, we had over 150 faculty and academic staff partnering with our African colleagues to create the University of Nigeria and Suka. And that really set the stage for what's now been six decades of work in Africa. And if you fast forward to today, uh, we, we work all over the world, but Africa still has a, well, a special place at, at MSU. We have over 250 researchers involved in work in Africa, and that's more than any other region of the world. In the last 10 years, they've generated over or just about $300 million for work in 54 different countries. We have 305 current African students here on campus and our, our database isn't the greatest, but, uh, but Amy's done some work on this and, and Mike, and we have over 2,500 African alumni that we can account for. And many of these are back on the continent and they're, they've kind of taken their, their degrees and have risen to high level positions in different organizations across the continent. We have almost two dozen faculty-led education abroad programs in Africa. We teach 76 different languages at MSU here. 30 of those are African languages. And we're very proud to have the, the number one ranked African study center in the United States here at Michigan State University. And so my, my message is that Africa is really woven into the fabric here at MSU and really into our, our DNA. And so that's, that's really led us to kind of think about, you know, what, what made a successful getting here and what is it, what does success look like going forward and what's it going to take to get there? And one of the things we did to kind of reimagine all this is in 2016, we brought a group of African thought leaders here to Michigan State University and, and uh, all of us uh, participate in this effort really thinking about what does do next generation partnerships look like? And we locked ourselves in a room for three days and what emerged out of that was the Alliance for African Partnerships. And this is a partnership platform and it's really designed to build capacity of African institutions and of Africans so that they can solve their own problems and so that they can own their own future. And it's built on really principles and values of co-creation, equity and inclusion. <clears throat> And today the, today, the alliance really consists of 10 partner African universities, Michigan State University, and a group, a, kind of a regional network of research institutes. But it touches many more institutions than just those, those core members. And we've been conducting program for about four, programs for about four years now. We're really excited. It's generated over 350 partnerships. It's involved over 500 faculty researchers from 100 different institutions in Africa. They've raised over $40 million in funding to support their work so far. We have uh, over 50 institutional capacity building projects that have taken place or are underway. 
There's a gender targeted scholars program. There are many events and dialogues that are attracting thousands of participants. So, so we're, we're really excited about the success of AAP so far, but we know we have to take it to another level as well going forward. And the importance of this work was really driven home to me uh, in February. I was able to participate in a, a summit in South Africa about US-Africa partnerships and the role of higher education. And this was a State Department sponsored and the State Department was there and the message was loud and clear that Africa, as, as you heard earlier, Africa is of strategic importance to the United States and universities and efforts like the Alliance for African Partnership have to play a critical role in nurturing and advancing that partnership going forward. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. I think uh, our speaker is uh, well known to us and uniquely positioned to lead us forward in a, in a dialogue around this important topic. So I'll turn it back over to Jose. Thank you, Steve. So I'm going to introduce our speaker. I promise I'll be I'll be short. He has a very illustrious uh, biography. It's um, he's a dear friend and colleague to the Alliance for African Partnership. He his university where he served as the vice chancellor of the U.S. International University in Kenya. They, it was one of our member uh, universities in the consortium. And he was also a member of the, of the Alliance for African Partnership Board of, of um, Advisory Board. So we know him. Uh, he was part, in fact, he is partly responsible for the AAP here. He's one of those who attended the convening that started the whole AAP. So he is known to us from the beginning and uh, continues to be a colleague and uh, advisor uh, informally to, to the AAP. So he's currently the Associate Provost and North Star Distinguished Professor at Case Western, University, Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. He's been there now for, I think, about two or three years. One, one and a half. Okay, all right. Uh, he's had a distinguished career um, serving in, in different leadership positions across the United States and Canada. Uh, some of the universities, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Penn State, University of Illinois at Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. So a long and illustrious career. He is the architect for the Carnegie Corporation of New York, a sponsored Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program. He did an extensive research uh, project that then resulted in this program where Af the African diaspora are contributing to the development of Africa. Uh, and it is still in progress as, as we speak. He's published more than 400 journal articles, book chapters, and is currently editing uh, a volume of reflections by former vice chancellors of some of Africa's leading universities. And the title of the book is The Chronicles of African University Leaders. I think I've had the pleasure of reading some of those on your LinkedIn page. Maybe those might be some of the, the, the interesting parts that you will share in the final uh, book, but we look forward to reading that book when it comes out. So he has received numerous awards and has raised tens of millions of dollars, last of which I think the major one that I think you can, you can speak about in your career is the $63 million project that you received uh, from the MasterCard Foundation just before you left um, USIU. So we welcome this uh, scholar and a uh, friend of the AAP, and we look forward to the comments that you provide to us about the engagement of US and African universities in the US African strategy. Well, to please uh, send in, you know, put your questions in the chat, is it chat? in the Q&A, and um, just to make sure that we have some questions by the time we we get to the Q and A section. Those in the room will also have lots of questions, I'm sure. So those in on virtual, please remember us. Put your questions for us. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's truly a pleasure being back here. I've been to uh, MSU for many times. Uh, when I was in Illinois, I used to come here uh, to work with colleagues at the Center for African Studies. And uh, as uh, Jose mentioned, uh, I was uh, very uh, delighted, privileged to be 
uh, invited to the discussions in 2016 that led to the formation of the Alliance for African Partnership and uh, for several years served on the uh, advisory board. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Jose for uh, the invitation uh, to come here today and colleagues in the uh, Alliance for African Partnership uh, for the opportunity to share ideas uh, on, on uh, US African relations. And then uh, of course, I'm also very grateful to Steve Hansen, who I've met uh, several times uh, for uh, you know, the amazing work uh, that he has done uh, to continue uh, MSU's remarkable journey in promoting uh, productive partnerships <coughs> with African institutions, as well as other world regions. And of course, Titus, it's uh, wonderful to see you in person. We've met a few times online. Uh, that's the life of these days. Uh, you, you seem to know people. Until you meet them, you say, is he that short? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's, 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 uh, um, I've titled my, my talk, uh, Africa-US Relations from Geopolitics to Education. So I'm going to talk about uh, these uh, five issues. Uh, some, you know, some of them, of course, very briefly, um, uh, as as a way of trying to frame our understanding of the relationship uh, between Africa and the United States in general, uh, but also end with uh, some reflections on what this means for higher education partnerships. Relations between Africa and the United States have a long and complex history and are multifaceted. <clears throat> They're embedded in the shifting constellation of complex global forces. They are rooted in the Atlantic slave trade that brought millions of Africans to the Americas as enslaved people, a monumental development out of which the modern world system emerged. They were forged in the crucibles of slavery and segregation in the United States and European colonialism in Africa, out of which Pan-Africanism emerged. After World War II, they were mediated by the geopolitics of the Cold War, cohered around the new post-war superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Interwoven in this maelstrom were the reverberations of struggles for independence in Africa and civil rights in the United States, which ushered a new, in a new era of interstate relations. Towards the end of the 20th century, Africa-US relations were structured by a new wave of globalization. And as the 21st century unfolds, they are increasingly framed by the forces of deep globalization and hegemonic rivalries between the United States and China. In this presentation, I'd like to provide a broad conceptual mapping of US-Africa relations, and they are complex, often contradictory, and always changing dynamics. It is divided into uh, five parts. So the first one is deciphering international relations. Analysis of international relations, as we all know, vary according to discipline, paradigm, and phenomenon being analyzed. The field of international relations has also had complex relations with other disciplines in the social sciences and humanities. Since the 1980s and 1990s, there has been growing interdisciplinarity within the discipline and with other disciplines influenced by social theory, international political economy, historical sociology, and globalization perspectives, among others. There have uh, been shifts in the phenomena and themes studied. First, in terms of dominant actors. Focus used to be on states. Now it includes transnational corporations, classes, organizations, and social movements. Second, previously, scholars concentrated on strategic relations among the great powers. Now they include relations between uh, core and peripheries in the world system and the dynamics of global civil society. Third, with reference to the dominant empirical issues, preoccupation with the distribution of military power, arms control, and crisis management has been joined by issues of globalization, inequality, identity politics, human rights, refugees, gender, ecology, health, and transnational crime and networks. Finally, the range of ethical issues studied 
has expanded to include debates on just war, humanitarian intervention, global redistribution of power and wealth, responsibility to nature, non-human species and future generations, respect for cultural differences and the rights of vulnerable social groups and communities. Among the traditional approaches that dominated international relations is realism and uh, its mutation, neorealism. Realist focus uh, on states as rational actors protecting their interests and how self-interest drives state actions in a competitive and anarchic uh, global system. Neorealists maintain that the distribution of, of capabilities, especially among the leading powers, determines the international structure and shapes outcomes. Another influential or paradigm is liberalism and neoliberalism. Liberalism advocates the power of human reason and progress. It focuses on state preferences rather than capabilities and the plurality of state actors and multi-dimensionality of state actions, including, of course, economic and cultural, and the possibilities of interstate cooperation and harmony. The third approach uh, is Marxism, which stresses the primacy of economic and material forces in international relations, or what some people would call historical materialism. Marxists focus on the interplay of states and markets, power and production, and the state system and world capitalist economy. They stress global inequalities and how the developed capitalist countries exercise hegemonic power on the world uh, order through coercion and uh, consent. Among the newer, approach, uh, newer approaches, five stand out. The first is critical theory, which stresses the connection between knowledge and interests, that theories of international relations are conditioned like any other, uh, uh, any knowledge by history and social, cultural and ideological context. So they are not objective or neutral. It perceives the modern state and political communities as socially and historically determined whose development must be explained, not taken for granted. The second is postmodernism, which incorporates elements of critical thought in its analysis of power and knowledge that the production of knowledge is a normative and uh, political process and operations of power fit within existing structures and discourses. It sees many of the problems studied in international relations also as matters of power and authority, of struggles to impose authoritative interpretations. This calls for deconstruction and double reading of how any totality, whether a text, theory, discourse, or structure is constituted and deconstituted. The third is constructivism, which developed after the end of the Cold War to explain world politics, which the neo-realists and neoliberals had failed to predict, and the critical theories would not adequately, in their view, explain. It contains structures shape the behavior of social and political actors, uh, whether uh, uh, states or individuals, and that normative or ideational and material structures are equally important and mutually constitutive. Constructivists argue the social identities of actors inform how they develop their interests and in turn action. The fourth is feminism that gained currency from the 1970s and 1980s. Feminists stress the importance of gender relations as an analytic category in studies of foreign policy, security, power, global political and global political economy. Empirically, they uh, incorporate women's lives and experiences in the study of international relations. Analytically, they deconstruct the gender biases that pervert, uh, pervert core concepts in international relations and prevent comprehensive understanding. And normatively, they offer a feminist agenda for global change. Finally, there is ecocentricism, which grew out of environmental politics that emerged as an important political force from the 1970s. Green political theory rejects an anthropocentric worldview that values humans at the expense of other living things and ecosystems. It takes a holistic view about the interconnectedness of all ecological relationships, including the human and non-human worlds, current and future generations, the need for the ethical and sustainable use of resources. Green politics uh, offers a distinctive critique of the prevailing state system and proposes a restructuring of the global order. 
its proponents recommend reclaiming the commons and global environmental governance that doesn't entirely depend on separate states. Shifts in the world order. The world system after World War II was characterized by profound changes. Six deserve emphasis. First is decolonization. The decolonization of Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean is perhaps the most important political event of the 20th century. The demise of the European empires in Africa and Asia led to the emergence of, country, of countries formerly colonized, uh, formerly colonized uh, countries as major players in global affairs. Progressively, their demographic, economic, political, educational, and cultural weight in the world system rose at the expense of Euro-American, uh, uh, Euro-America that had enjoyed global hegemony since the 15th century. At the dawn of the 21st century, it was no longer fanciful to say uh, it would be an Asian century and that uh, the importance of Africa was rising. Second was the Cold War. The superpower rivalries between the United States and the Soviet Union and their respective alliances, which had an immense impact on the world. It opened historic, uh, historic space for the nationalist movements in Africa and Asia to achieve independence from the recalcitrant imperial powers of Europe, whose global supremacy was vanquished materially and ideologically by World War II. The former colonial superpowers, Britain and France, became supplicants of the United States. However, the Cold War also turned many parts of Africa and Asia into theaters of proxy hot wars. Moreover, it spawned the formation of third world solidarity movements, such as the Non-Aligned Movement and the Group of 77 in the United Nations. Third was the emergence of what some have called multilateral imperialism and its countervailing forces. It manifested itself in the expansion of multinational and transnational corporations, which increasingly played an important role in the world economy through trade and investment and their technical and intellectual property rights. They exercise power over local governments and economies in various ways. The expansion of multilateral capitalism was counterbalanced by the growth of old and new social, uh, transnational social movements. The old social movements included labor, religious, socialist, suffragist, civil rights, and nationalist organizations that focused on political and economic issues. From the 1960s and 1970s, new <coughs> social movements emerged organized around struggles uh, by um, women's environmental, gay rights, animal rights, and anti-globalization and peace movements that focus on cultural, social, and identity issues. Struggles by countries of the global south intensified for new international economic order, new information and, uh, and communication order, and so on. Fourth, the global economic and geopolitical landscape changed after World War II, um, uh, uh, you know, as, as the war receded into history. The global importance <coughs> of the developing countries rose. And I have a series of tables. I'm not going to dwell on those tables uh, but for illustrative purposes. Uh, so this gives you an idea of um, sort of the, the, the economic uh, you know, shifts uh, that are, 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 you know, where the world was around 2019 and 2020. Uh, I could of course give you a longitude, you know, <laughs> you know uh, which shows you that uh, by 2019, 2020, uh, the developing countries are, accounted for 40.55% uh, of world GDP, 48% of foreign direct investment, 45.9% of merchandise trade, 21.2% uh, of trade uh, in services, and 83.46% of the, uh, uh, the world population. Um, and then, uh, yes, um, the, and then there's, there are other tables uh, which, um, yeah. Um, 
Oh yeah, this uh, this one is um, uh, on on the uh, investment uh, you know, gross uh, foreign direct investment uh, uh, worldwide. Again, you know, just shows you uh, increasingly these countries are becoming important players in that area. Uh, the, the, this one is on uh, um, what is the heading of this? Oh, exports, merchandise exports and, and service exports. Um, is, is the next one again? You know, just you know the, the figures that I summarize. Uh, you can see that uh, that uh, the developing world is becoming increasingly uh, critical. Uh, and this one is on uh, uh, exports, imports, trade balance, and all that. Again, uh, as I said, I'm not going to go into details, but you know, um, it shows you the uh, dynamics that are taking place by 2019, 2020. Yeah. Uh, and this one is on population. Uh, again, uh, you see the shifts in the population uh, that have taken place by this time. And, and of course, if you go back decades, uh, you can see the huge transformation that is taking place. Most of um, yeah. um, most of the oh yeah, not before. Uh, most of the uh, spectacular growth was in Asia. Africa uh, lagged behind, although it made rapid progress after independence in all key social economic indicators, but uh, its development decelerated sharply during the last decades of the 1980s and 1990s under draconian structural adjustment programs imposed with fundamentalist zeal by the international financial institutions. And even growth and development returned from the 2000s, a trajectory captured with the exaggerated euphoria of the Africa rising narrative. Fifth was the emergence of the United Nations as a key arena in global affairs. Its membership grew from 51 uh, in uh, countries in 1945 to 193 currently, largely the result of decolonization in Africa and Asia and the breakup of the Soviet empire in Central and Eastern Europe. Its three key objectives promotion of peacekeeping and security, human rights and economic development and humanitarian assistance, assistance made it a focal point of global debate, norm setting and initiatives and interventions. The UN human rights covenants enriched struggles for political, socioeconomic, and what some people call solidarity rights and the empowerment of women, the youth and the indigenous people. The UN also mobilized development assistance enriched development discourse through the publications of its human development reports, mainstreaming uh, of uh, environmental issues and uh, es the establishment of development visions from the millenni millennium development goals to the current uh, sustainable development goals. However, real power in the UN lies with the Security Council, whose five mem permanent members were the victors of World War II when the bark of Asian and African countries were still under colonial rule. Consequently, demands have grown to reform the council to reflect contemporary realities, including the representation of Africa and Latin America. The Africa group makes up the largest regional bloc in the United Nations, 28% of members. The UN has played a major role in African affairs and vice versa. It served as an important platform for decolonization and leveraging African international influence. African um, policy thinkers have also contributed to the development of new doctrines and practices, such as the doctrines of humanitarian intervention and right to protect and notions of collective or solidarity rights, the third generation of human rights. The role of UN agencies has been contradictory. Some have provided critical humanitarian assistance, while others, such as the World Bank and IMF, have constrained policy space for development. Finally, there was globalization. Studies of globalization from the 1990s were framed through the paradigms of international political economy, dependency theory, world systems theory, and various international relations perspectives noted earlier. Scholars of globalization focus on different themes and topics and what they see as the dominant phenomena, forces, dynamics, actors, relationships, empirical and ethical issues. 
globalization discourses are often dominated by presentist, uh, presentist and Eurocentric views rather than more multicentric comparative and long durée perspectives of global history. Adopting a long view of globalization helps us understand that many of the features of contemporary globalization are not new. It helps also to deconstruct Eurocentricism, underscores that globalization is a process of growing connectivity and density of connections that has undergone several phases. And uh, I have a series uh, of, again, sort of uh, tables that shows you, uh, this one shows you how the different fields really, uh, the area they tend to emphasize when they're studying globalization. So in political science, you know, the, the kinds of things they talk about, internationalization of the state, international NGOs, and so development studies focuses on international financial institutions, uh, geography, of course, space and, and, and the place and, and the local global interactions, economics, uh, you know, they tend to focus on multinational corporations and so on, uh, cultural studies, you know, media, film, advertising, and, and so on and then sociology, uh, issues of modernity, uh, and, and, and political economy, and so on and so forth. Um, so the, 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 you know, that, that's again to be expected. And then uh, there are some scholars, there are some scholars who have, uh, that means a little faint, you can't read it properly. I'll share the slides if you're interested. Uh, there are some scholars who have tried to develop mappings of globalization over the last 500 years. In other words, you know, globalization is not new. Uh, and some people even over the last 1,000 years. And others going back to uh, you know, 3,000 BC. Uh, the world in very complicated ways uh, has been uh, increasingly connected. OK. And, and in this one, um, what I'm trying to show you is uh, issues of migration uh, currently. Um, and, and a lot of us get worked up, particular politicians, about uh, being invaded by migrants. You know, in, in, in 2000, uh, migrants in international were about 2.8% of the world population. By 2020, they were 3.6%. So they're not, people are not clamoring to leave their homes. People stay home. More than 95% of the world stays at home. Uh, you wouldn't know that from the sort of angry populisms of certain populi uh, politicians. Um, and this one uh, shows you the uh, share of, of the uh, migrants uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in different uh, 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 world regions. Uh, so Africa, if by uh, 2020, uh, 20, um, you know, it, it uh, had 9% uh, uh, of the world's uh, migrants that constituted 1.9% of the African population. Uh, and then the other regions you see, uh, again, uh, those, uh, those uh, so there are differences uh, in different regions, um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, contrary again to the popular media, uh, most Africans, you know, who migrate, migrate to other African countries. They're not trying to come to the US. Yes, some of us are here. Uh, uh, so again, it, it helps to put perspective into what is really going on. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. um, in some intellectual and policy circles, there is a tendency to see Africa as marginal to globalization, when it has in fact been central to the construction of the modern world in all its ramifications economic, political, cultural, and discursive because of the massive contributions of Africa and Africans during the long centuries of the Atlantic slave trade and European colonialism. I see in my own work, globalization as a complex historical process that has undergone various phases, that it is multifaceted in its dynamics and characterized by the compression of time and space and intensive flows of capital, commodities, and culture, images, ideologies, and institutions, values, viruses, and violence, as well as plants, people, and pollutants. And that it represents an ideological project in its current normative uh, um, discourse. 
since the 1980s, the organization has been marked by the gospel of neoliberalism, which has generated both anxiety and excitement, as well as uh, advocates, ambivalent and antagonists. The pendulum seems to have swung to the opponent of globalization. Thirdly, Africa's geopolitical interests and imperatives. African nationalism embraced what the late Tandikan Kandawiri called five historic and humanistic uh, tasks. Decolonization, nation building, development, democracy, and regional integration. Political independence was largely achieved with the end of the heinous apartheid regime in 1994. Although in African intellectual circles, the unfinished business of decolonization is fiercely debated. Nation building remains a work in progress, compromised by the intervention, the inventions, separatisms, and legacies of colonial tribalisms and reinforced by post-colonial authoritarianisms and populisms. However, national identities have congealed through the political performances of government authority. The struggles and dreams of sustainable growth and development have animated generations of policymakers, intergovernmental agencies, social movements, intellectuals and artists, and the beloved masses of political ideologues and democrats. Similarly powerful have been struggles and aspirations for democracy, human rights, and inclusion for groups marginalized based on gender, race, ethnicity, religion, region, and other markers of uh, difference. However, the steady trance of the colonial Leviathan survived decolonization. As the independence social contract collapsed under structural adjustment programs in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, which spawned severe recessions of development and democracy, struggles for the second independence gathered momentum. Since the turn of the 2000s, democratization has experienced a checkered history of progress and setbacks, evident in the expansion of political freedoms and association of space, as well as mobilization of sectarian divisions and manipulation of electoral processes. Above all, the marriage between development and democracy remains a rocky one. Regional integration has progressed in fits and starts, fueled by lingering Pan-African impulses and the imperatives of regionalism in a highly competitive world economy facing the headwinds of deglobalization. However, it has proved susceptible to the challenges and the constraints of ideological differences and disputes, alignment of regional integration and nation building and territorial integrity, the problems of uneven development and distribution of benefits equally among member states that vary in size and development levels, in effective institution and organizational structures, and external dependency and interference. The African continental free trade area launched in January 2021 marks a major milestone in the regional integration drive. This five-pronged agenda drives the continent's international relations. It is the complex calculus upon which the benefits and drawbacks of international engagement are measured. The major powers of Euro-America, many of which were colonial powers, or burdened with their own imperialisms, as is the case with the United States, have a sorry record on African decolonization. Their cynical support for friendly or client dictatorships and renegade or rebel movements undermine the causes of nation building, uh, democracy, and development. The preference by the European Union and the United States for bilateral rather than multilateral partnerships with the continent's regional economic community militates against the regionalization agenda. The propensity of the United States and others in the global north to divide the continent into Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa is an outdated Eurocentric homage to the Hegelian construct of Africa. There is no regional organization on the continent premised on the racialized contraption of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
the dynamics of United States Africa policy. Beyond the rhetoric of different administrations, it is important to understand that US foreign policy reflects internal and external structural dynamics. After World War II, the United States emerged as one of the world's two superpowers. Then after the end of the Cold War, it briefly enjoyed uncontested supremacy as the sole superpower, a status that did not last as China emerged as a credible and competitive rival. It could be argued then that since 1945, any US administration's policies have been set in a context of hegemonic superpower, of a hegemonic superpower in which there are multiple competing and intersected players from the military industrial complex, the financial complex, the media knowledge complex, and the civic complex with its web of cultural, social, humanitarian, and religious organizations and networks. Another critical dimension uh, concerns the role, uh, dimension rather, concerns the role of the country's multiple diasporas, historically, mainly from Europe and Africa, and more recently from Asia. As I've shown elsewhere, before the 1970s, the role of diasporas and ethnic lobbies in the development of US foreign policy was largely ignored due to assimilationist notions of US society in which uh, racial and ethnic influences on foreign policy were hardly recognized. Scholarly attention was concentrated on the role and debates among professional foreign policy elites. The diaspora leaders and communities advocating for their homeland risk being suspected of dual loyalty. However, all along, US policy, foreign policy, was blatantly Anglo-Saxon in outlook. The rise of multiculturalism in the aftermath of the civil rights movement led to a new appreciation of the role of diasporas and ethnic communities as political actors in the previously exclusive WASP corridors of foreign policy making. Clearly, US foreign policy has been characterized by the interactions and intersections of global imperialism and domestic racism and driven by both geopolitical strategic interests and the narratives of whiteness. African Americans saw an, uh, African -Americans saw an intricate connection between their struggles for emancipation from slavery and segregation and their country's paternalistic engagements with Africa. This awareness and activism were braided into the rolling history of transatlantic Pan-Africans. In his fascinating book, Between Homeland and Motherland, Africa, US uh, Foreign Policy, and Black <coughs> Leadership in America, Arvin Tillery says, quote, Black leaders tend to make their most robust transnationalist or Pan-African expressions in the US policy-making arena when such activism dovetails with the goals that they are pursuing in the domestic arena, end of quote. Thus, levels of identification with, uh, with Africa rise and fall with the changing conditions of racial oppression in the United States and how the domestication of foreign policy issues and mobilization over them help advance African American interests at home. Pan Africanism was palpable over the founding of Liberia in the early 19th century and defending it from European colonial encroachment in the early 20th century over the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935, the symbol of African sovereignty, and later during the decolonization drama in the 1950s and 1960s, when civil rights itself in the US was at its crescendo, and the mounting struggles against apartheid in the 1970s and 1980s, and following the election of President Barack Obama in 2008. Prior to independence and the Cold War, African American civil rights activists were the main advocates for enlightened American policy toward Africa. The United States treated Africa with benign neglect and deferred to the colonial powers until World War II. The era of interstate relations between African countries and the United States, as I indicated earlier, dawned uh, uh, after decolonization. On the US side, they have largely been framed through the uh, prism of what I call the humanitarian paradigm. 
which has two facets. One is the perspective of Africa as a zone of humanitarian disasters in need of constant social welfare assistance and intervention. The other centers on Africa's apparent need for human rights, modeled on idealized Western principles that have never prevented Euro-America from perpetrating the barbarities of slavery, colonialism, the two world wars, other imperial wars, and genocides, including the Holocaust. This ideology is characterized by inconsistencies, contradictions, and hypocrisies, because it is always trapped by national security and political interests, rather than by African interests. And it represents the jostling of different, uh, different traditions in American political thought and culture. These include the traditions of cosmopolitanism and universalism, the providential nationalism and exceptionalism that led President George W. Bush's radical unilateralism and President Trump's strident American first selective thinking and the posturing of realism and uh, uh, pragmatism advanced by the Clinton and Obama administrations and inherited by the Biden administration. The Clinton years coincided with the end of the Cold War. Initially, US interest in Africa diminished, which was evident in declining US presence, timid responses to violent conflicts, uh, closure of the United States International uh, Information Agency, and stagnation in foreign aid. Clinton cynically and prematurely embraced a group of new strongmen as Africa's visionary leaders and watched Rwanda descend into the inferno of genocide by refusing to level it as such, which would have triggered international intervention. More positively, his administration established the Africa Growth uh, Opportunity Act to give African countries greater access to the US market. But it was not a negotiated agreement. Rather, the US president could grant or rescind bilateral <coughs> concessions to African countries. Many analysts argue that its impact has been limited. When Rwanda raised duties on imported American used cloth to promote uh, local manufacturing, it lost the duty-free benefits for its textile exports. The Bush era was hardly a year old when the terrorist attacks of 9-11 shook the United States. Focus shifted to the war on terror, which entailed the militarization of US policy through the securitization of US aid and the establishment of Africa Command or AFRICOM that was widely opposed by African government and public opinion. The Millennium Challenge account to promote poverty reduction uh, reprised the much detested conditionalities of the international financial institutions. Bush's signature program for which he was praised in many quarters was the President's uh, Emergency Plan for Aid Relief, PEPFAR. Overall, uh, there was a lack of, uh, of an uh, 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 vision, proliferation of uncoordinated agencies and programs, negligence of good governance and human rights, low leverage of uh, internal conflicts, and of course, the Great Recession 2024. President Obama's election generated great expectations within Africa and across the diaspora that were unfulfilled. His administration advanced four goals, strengthened democratic institutions by promoting accountable, transparent, and responsive governance, bolstering uh, positive models and promoting and protecting human rights, civil society, and independent media, to spur economic growth, trade, and investment, by promoting an enabling environment and encouraging US companies to invest, uh, promoting regional integration and expanding African capacity to effectively access and benefit from global markets. Three, advance peace and security by uh, countering Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups, advancing uh, regional security cooperation as, um, and promote and for uh, promote uh, opportunity and development by addressing constraints to growth and poverty reduction, 
fostering food security, transforming Africa's public health, increasing opportunities for women and youth, and promoting resilience to climate change, uh, low uh, emissions growth, and sustainable development. There were continuities under the Obama administration with previous US policies. In its discourses and policies on African development, it relied on, pro on the programs of the Clint uh, Clinton and Bush administrations, AGOA and PEPFAR, and propagated neoliberal policies promoted by the international financial institutions. The militarization of US policy towards Africa increased, which led most tragically to the US-led NATO attack on Libya in the face of African opposition, which ushered the ouster of Gaddafi and the prolonged destabilization of Libya and the Sahel region. Obama came to regard this as the worst mistake of his presidency. By the time the US held its first Africa summit, emulating Japan and China that had established the practice in the 1990s and early 2000s, respectively, the last star had vanished. Some African observers were scathing on the theatrics and limited impact of the summit. Like his two predecessors, President Obama launched his own touch on program, Power Africa, to increase energy access to end uh, energy poverty in sub Saharan Africa. President Trump rode to power on the populist wave of anti globalization fueled by the Great Recession and the resurgence of white supremacy. Under the America First mantra, he was determined to erase the legacy of his predecessor, several of whose programs were abandoned. His unabashed racism at home was matched by his disdain for Africa. The travel bans introduced at the beginning of his presidency largely targeted majority Muslim and African nations, which he reviled, as we all know, as shithole countries. Towards the end of his presidency, uh, restrictive student visas were introduced against several countries, 21 of them Af uh, from Africa. Nevertheless, the Trump administration launched its own landmark Africa program called Prosper Africa in 2018 to enhance investment and the business environment. The creation of the Development Finance Corporation was finalized um, to provide credit of $60 billion uh, for American businesses to invest in emerging markets. Trump's policies, like those of his predecessors, were premised on neoliberal principles and competition with China as a global strategic rival. A trade war, as we all know, with China was launched in 2018 that has had very complicated repercussions on the US economy as well as other parts of the world. <laughs> Under the Biden administration, some of the policy priorities of the Obama administration towards Africa were revived and revised. The US strategy towards Sub Saharan Africa issued in August 2022 bears remarkable similarities in tone and substance to the Obama strategy. It too has four goals, foster openness and open societies, deliver democratic and security dividends, advance pandemic recovery and economic opportunity, and support conservation, climate adaptation, and a full energy transition. Under each priority, as uh, many of you know, are listed several initiatives, many of them rehashed from previous policy documents. Its review of three decades in that report, a short review of the three decades of US-Africa partnership uh, is largely celebratory. While in its prognosis for the future, it calls for elevating the US-Africa partnership engaging more African states, bolstering civil society, transcending what it calls the artificial bureaucratic division between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And I hope after this, there'll be no more reports on Sub-Saharan Africa, but on Africa policy. Engaging America's African diaspora and le leveraging US private sector and domestic leadership. Predictably, it attacks China 
by China's and Russia's involvement in Africa as nefarious and part of their drive to break the rules of this international order. American policymakers and pundits are eager to proclaim the superiority of the American development model over China's, which they dismiss as predatory. They remain locked in outdated humanitarian and, uh, and security imperatives um, remaking under the new uh, uh, Cold War, as it were. In 2021, trade between China and Africa reached $254 billion, while it declined for the US to $64 billion, from $142 billion in 2008, the year before the US was, was overtaken by China. Chinese investment also eclipses America's, which clings to Dambisa Moyo's dead end. One article in Foreign Affairs uh, from September last year, uh, the author writes, in truth, wealthy Western donor countries are not always honest about the assistance they provide. They find ways to exaggerate their real commitments through creative and dubious accounting practices meant to expand the definition of development aid spending. And when it comes to the other category of assistance <coughs> that wealthy countries owe to developing ones, finance to help the global south mitigate and adapt to climate change, rich countries fall egregiously short of what they have pledged, which in turn tragically uh, is in turn tragically short of what uh, poor ones need. Any productive American engagement with Africa requires, argues another article in foreign affairs, reframing Africa geographically by abandoning what I indicated as the Eurocentric division of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, supporting strong institutions of uh, individual leaders, repudiating, I quote, the narrative that it is battling China for primacy in Africa, end of course, and embarking uh, and embracing, sorry, African voices in international forums and geopolitical interests by reforming the United Nations Security Council and the architecture of international financial institutions. Ignorance or disregard of African geopolitical interests will not serve any global power well as its ill-informed pressures will be met by African resentment and resistance. Current American diplomatic pressure on African countries over Ukraine, as we have seen, is deeply problematic and is unlikely to succeed. Africans do not want to be caught between the United States and Russia and become pawns in new proxy wars. Finally, um, the framing international partnerships between American and African investments. It is instructive that for all the rhetoric on resetting US-Africa relations to promote sustainable development and resilience, uh, there is little about education. American investors must prevail on the Biden administration and future administrations to take education diplomacy in Africa as seriously as China is doing, not to compete with the latter, but as part of uh, Africa's drive to turn the youth barge into a demographic dividend for the continent itself and the rest of the world. The incentives and justifications for higher education internationalization are well known. They include national development and demographic imperatives. Many investors pursue internationalization for financial reasons as a, a critical revenue stream and an asset in the, in the intensifying competition for talented students, faculty, resources, and reputation capital. Others stress academic and uh, diversity rationales that internationalization enhances the quality of learning and facilitates institutional diversity. The experiences of African universities with internationalization are complex and contradictory because of colonial and post-colonial histories uh, and the international division of intellectual labor. This leads to a paradox. 
um, the African universities are simultaneously highly internationalized and constitute the most international, internationally peripheral system at the same time. As the 21st century progresses, Africa will become more and more important to the world economy, to geopolitics, and the global flow of flows of people and culture. Unfortunately, epistemic communities in North America and Europe often exhibit and reproduce racist, Eurocentric, and ethnocentric exclusions rooted in slavery and colonialism. It is as if they are afflicted by an ever mutating virus of Afrophobia that dehumanizes, historicizes, and disparages African societies, spaces, social systems, uh, struggles, and knowledges. The first reason to take Africa seriously is historical. As noted earlier, the modern world system that emerged uh, from the 15th century is inconceivable without the contributions of the enslaved Africans and their uh, descendants. Lest we forget, before the abolition of slavery, um, the forced migrations of Africans outstripped voluntary migrations from Europe to the Americas and helped lay the foundations of the new secular society. The second reason is demographic. Africa's population is exploding so that on current trends, it will comprise 25% of the world's population by 2050, rising to 40% by uh, uh, 2100, from 9% in 1960, the so-called year of African independence. The implications of this monumental development for international affairs has yet to sink in. The third imperative is geopolitical. In an interconnected but increasingly polarized world, Africa's voice is likely to grow, perhaps reprising the politics of non-alignment during the Cold War era. The fourth reason is intellectual. It is the height of scientific perfidy to assume that analytical frameworks constructed out of the experiences, often ideals, of the limited historical geographies of European descended peoples have the epistemological and predictive power to capture the totality and trajectory of the human experience on this planet. I'd like to conclude with a 12 pronged agenda that encapsulates internationalization trends that are both old and new. First, internationalization and global higher education partnerships and collaborations must be based on the principles of open science, on open science uh, outlined in the UNESCO recommendation on open science published in 2021 that urges states, universities, and other scientific institutions to promote a common understanding, develop an enabling policy environment, and invest in open science infrastructures and services. Separate, there is need to promote transformative technology-based uh, uh, technology-enhanced partnerships through inter-institutional collaboration and consortia that offer innovative enrollment opportunities for students, online program management, virtual and in-person internships, quality assurance, and more seamless credit transfer. Third, an expansive view of internationalization that in integrates internationalization abroad and at home and embraces internationalization of the curriculum and research is essential. It implies international exposure that is mediated through intentional interactions with local communities that have origins in different parts of the world and embedding global perspectives in the curriculum. Fourth, there is the question of how to finance sustainable and equitable internationalization among institutions and countries that sometimes have divergent economic resources and needs, which requires candid discussions and the development of pragmatic financial models and institutional investments. It entails rethinking student aid for dispersed students and many other financial aspects of the distributed university uh, whose uh, functions and impact are spread across domestic and international domains and physical and virtual arenas. Fifth, in addition to the traditional focus on student mobility and exchanges, internationalization should focus more on building faculty and staff capabilities and collaborations. Worldwide, 
international faculty constitute a tiny minority of overall faculty and staff members. Universities that are serious about internationalization should seek to employ more international faculty. Six is the imperative of promoting ethical internationalization based on the principles of diversity, inclusion, equal opportunities, solidarity, co-creation, and the reciprocity and shared benefits. It also involves critical engagement with the identities and experiences of international students and faculty, especially regarding race and racism through critical diversity uh, literacy that avoids equating diversity to cultural difference and furnishes a vocabulary to discuss privilege and oppression, translate and interpret uh, coded hegemonic practices and analyze the ways that diversity hierarchies and institution, institutionalized oppressions are uh, inflected, inflected in uh, specific uh, social context. Seven is the question of how to pursue what some call smart internationalization, which involves integrating internationalization uh, um, in institutional mission, values, strategic plan, budgeting priorities, and culture. The issue of differential tuition for domestic and international students is part of the calculus of dumb and smart internationalization. Treating foreign students as cash cows raises troubling moral questions and is unsustainable. Adam Habib, the former vice chancellor of the Wits University in South Africa and currently head of SOAS in London at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies has raised uncomfortable questions among his British university leaders about the ethics of using foreign students, many of them from poor countries in the global south to subsidize domestic students in Britain, Canada, Australia, and the United States. Eighth, as part of the internationalization agenda, universities need to become stronger advocates for more progressive forms, uh, forms of globalization as the specter of deglobalization spreads its uh, xenophobic tentacles. Universities must, uh, as noted in a report by uh, UNESCO, act responsibly, quote, for our common humanity, promoting well being and sustainability, drawing strength from intercultural and epistemic diversity, and upholding and creating interconnectedness at multiple levels, end of quote. They have a more immediate interest, that is, universities, in developing systems for easier credit transfer and uh, qualification recognition frameworks, especially as transnational, uh, transnational multi-institutional partnerships expand. Uh, and of course, uh, as uh, uh, various regional higher education areas uh, developed to facilitate that. Ninth, the impact of rankings that has become increasingly influential and ubiquitous must be interrogated. They have helped sanctify global academic capitalism by generating fierce competition among universities in a relentless race for reputational status that validates the hegemony of institutions in the global north and the primacy of research at the expense of teaching and learning and social impact. Tenth, it is critical to probe the growth of international research and its implications as evident in the expansion of publications with international co-authors, increased funding for international research through grants from international organizations, national agencies, and universities' own resources. The scale of the challenge of human capacity development in Africa is such that no single institution or bilateral partnership can address. More can be achieved by developing partnerships through consortia of universities in the global north and the global south. For example, in Europe, the Guild of European Universities and the African Research uh, Universities Alliance are collaborating to establish about 20 doctoral academies in, African, uh, in Africa, organized around four clusters of excellence. Green transitions, public health, technology and, uh, and, and innovation, and capacity development. The source of funding for this is derived from the EU African Union strategy under the innovation agenda that will provide half a billion euros 
um, you know, over the next several years. Similar massive consortia programs must be established between American and African university associations. 11, the growth of inter international program and provider mobility, IPPM, needs to be critically assessed. It is evident in the establishment of international branch campuses, international joint universities, joint and double degree programs, franchise arrangements, and distance education. All too often, however, the branch campuses are of poorer quality than their home campuses. By 2020, there were more than 300 branch campuses, uh, close to half of which were run by universities in the United States of Britain. The pursuit of mutually be uh, beneficial relationships suggests that we move away from branch campuses on, uh, in favor of co-developed programs. Finally, the academic diasporas must be effectively mobilized uh, on both sides. In this regard, the new African diaspora will be an important part of the equation, just like the historic African diaspora must also be mobilized as part of US uh, engagement with Africa in education as well as other arenas. The new African diaspora uh, is not only Africa's biggest donor, so the biggest donor to Africa is not China, it's not the EU, it's not the United States, it's the African diaspora. In 2019, they remitted $84.3 billion to the continent. This diaspora, the new diaspora, is also a huge asset for what can be called intellectual remittance. African migrants are among the most educated populations in their countries of residence. For example, in the United States, the 2.1 million immigrants from Sub-Saharan Africa got from a population report by the US Census, <coughs> got, tend to have higher levels of education than the overall foreign and native born populations. In 2019, 42% of Sub-Saharan Africans ages 25 and over held a bachelor's degree or higher compared to 33% for both all foreign and US born adults, end of quote. This is a huge asset for brain circulation that needs to be strategically mobilized. Examples that need scaling up include the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program, uh, the Alliance for African Partnerships, and many others. In conclusion, as premier knowledge producing institutions, and primary engine of high quality human capital development, American and African universities in true partnership must lead the charge of informing and changing policies and girding relations between the United States and Africa that will yield dividends for themselves and their respective nations. Thank you. I think the, the, um, the closing word that I will give is that US and African universities must lead the charge. It is our responsibility to look at these policies and see how we can address the issues that have been included and um, how can we um, commit to, to changing some of the challenges that we see that are happening globally. So we're open now for um, questions. And we will start with those who are in the room, if there are any on the Q&A yet, no? So we, anything in the room, any questions? Professor Dunn, welcome to MSU. I know it's your, uh, you're visiting our colleague here, the African Future Scholar, Irene, from University of Botswana, so welcome. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Hope Tenzan. I'm from the University of Botswana by adoption. As some of you yes. recognize, I'm from the Caribbean, from the University of Botswana. I want to just quickly appreciate very much and consider myself very fortunate to be able to attend the lecture and the presentation which we just heard. 
I very much uh, concur with the analysis that's been put forward. And I just have a, a couple questions which I will quickly pose. Uh, I appreciate the extensive inclusion by Prof of the role of the diaspora and ethnic communities emerging as an important factor in global relations. I think that's very important. And it's a process that has been transpiring since the 1930s through the 1960s when the independence processes took over and which was called by very many names, but also mm -hmm. including this notion of Pan-Africanism in which my own region, the Caribbean, played a disproportionately important role in people like Martha Stavi. So I very much appreciate that. Uh, my two questions are firstly, what is your analysis of the role of technology in the present and future of globalization and US development world relationships? Are we seeing it as affirming the cleavages of the past, or are we seeing it as an opportunity for trans transformation and what I have called elsewhere the notion of globalization from below? So that's the first question. What's the role of technology? Secondly, how are you seeing China in the narrative of hegemony in relation to Africa? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, those are really great questions. Uh, who, which campus University of the West Indies? Mona campus. Yeah, that, that was my first job. <laughs> <laughs> so when I hear people from Mona, I'm very happy. Uh, so that was uh, after my PhD, my first job uh, was, was at the University of the West Indies. I won't tell you which years because you. <laughs> uh, it was 1982 when I went there to go. So uh, and I just went to uh, Jamaica over the Christmas break. See old friends, including Hillary, who was uh, my contemporary who joined the history department the same year in 1982. He's now the vice chancellor. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, so lovely to, to meet you. Um, role of technology. Uh, I think there are maybe three points uh, to make. One is, you know, the um, a lot of the analysis talk about the different industrial revolutions. And if we sort of, uh, take that, you find that Africa has always participated. Uh, in uh, all the industrial revolutions, but did not derive benefits. So the first one, the, you know, the industrial revolution in Britain was really a product of the emergence of the American system, in which, of course, uh, you know, the product of enslaved labor in the Americas, uh, caught on specifically, um, you, know, uh, you know, led to uh, you know, the development of the textile industries and, of course, you know, the financial capital that enabled the, the development. So, uh, in, in Britain and, and Europe more generally, and so on. Um, and, and, and so Africa, during that industrial revolution, its role was to provide complete attack, uh, in, in, in which, of course, that was a huge force. Now, the second and third industrial, you know, second industrial revolution uh, from the late 19th century, uh, 20th, 20th century, uh, coincided with colonialism. And, and Africa, of course, participated very heavily, but as a provider of materials. So, you know, uh, so initially, in the first one, we got uh, trinkets, in the second one, we got pieces. Um, the danger of Africa not actively participating in the current so called digital revolution uh, is uh, not only exploitation, but irrelevance. In that, um, uh, what you're finding is data is, is you know, some people say data is the new oil, it's actually more valuable. You know, because the data becomes more important for you can mine it and, and create all sorts of uh, value out of it. And uh, if, if Africa doesn't take this serious part, and already what you're finding, uh, just to give you an example from HPC, high performance computing, uh, much of that is really uh, you know, between the US and China. Uh, Africa has 0.2% uh, capacity in HPC. Uh, that is the biggest difference. 
which means Africa has to invest heavily in education. Has to invest heavily in the new industries. And of course, some progress is being made. If you look at indicators for uh, you know, internet, mobile usage and all that, it's, it's, it's exploding. But a lot of that is not being created locally. It's being exploded. So the thing is not only to consume, we have always consumed, but also to produce. And this means investment in R&D, serious investment. Uh, the latest figures show that Africa's R&D investments uh, in 2018, UNESCO uh, report that came out in 2021, World Science Report, shows that Africa was spending 0.9% of its gross domestic product on R&D. The world average is 1.79%. And this translates directly into you know, the levels of scientific publications, into the levels of patents, and, and, and all sorts of things. So serious investment in R&D in general, but in the cutting technologies. And if you look at that report, when you look at the cutting edge technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology, you name it, uh, Africa's production is even less. So there, there needs to be serious investment. The second area to focus on is the crafting of the re global regulatory environment for technology and not for Africa to be on the receiving end. Whatever decisions are made in Europe and, and, and uh, in China and, and in the United States, but to be a serious player in crafting the global regime or regimes, uh, the way we are going, we are going in different regions uh, of, of, of our digital technologies. And the third one, uh, you know, the, the final one is, is uh, how do we make sure that uh, particularly we facilitate young people? One of the things that impressed me when, when I was in Nairobi uh, you know, for six years was, was the energies of the youth. How do we mobilize these energies? In, you know, and I know that uh, the, uh, the Alliance for African Partnership focuses on that in terms of how do we you know, catalyze these entrepreneurial energies in ways that they turn into uh, you know, the creation of businesses uh, that provide decent employment? Because there are a lot of, you know, you know, when you look at employment in Africa, you find that a lot of the employment is really in the formal sector. And that is very precarious in the The conditions are, you know, in most cases are quite horrendous. How do you make sure that those energies are catalyzed and you create dignified uh, work and employment and, and conditions and so on? And, and, and again, you focus both on the traditional technologies, but also the new technologies. Uh, Africa has to be very careful, not always to jump on, you know, for the, you know, sort of the most recent and shining uh, you know, sort of uh, product, uh, Africa still needs to develop manufacturing capacity. Um, I just want to take one question from the, the virtual group. So this is a fellow Malawian, obviously, so kind of biased. <laughs> Lily, uh, who is also on our board, the AP board. Uh, so she says, thank you very much, Paul. Really great to see how much talent Malawi can produce. So she's saying that the terms, the new African diaspora and intellectual remittances of the African diaspora are extremely useful for addressing science, academia, and smart internationalization. The evidence of remittances is there, it cannot be refuted, and it's the elephant in the room. The question is, how does Africa strategically harness this huge resource? Because true to power, it is Africa that needs to take the lead. Uh, thank you for that vote of confidence from my fellow Malawi. Uh, so I think there are a number of things. One is making sure that uh, you know African countries don't just value the diaspora for its money and not allow them to participate. Uh, we know the Boston Tea Party and no taxation in that representation. Uh, we also need to, and a lot of African diaspora groups are fighting for greater representation which entails essentially a number of things. One is dual citizenship. More than 30 African countries have now uh, you know, enacted dual citizenship laws. Uh, a few have included the historic diaspora. I'll argue that more and more African countries need to provide citizenship opportunities for both the new diaspora as well as the historic diaspora. Um, 
the second area perhaps uh, to, to think about is also, and this is more with regards to uh, you know financial laws and regulations, and so on, to make it easier to invest uh, in, in local businesses, uh, local stock exchanges, and so on and so forth. A lot of diasporas, um, you know, every, every African we met in this country will tell you in those days will tell you where Western Union is or where money can now you can read, of course, online. Um, one of the things we need to fight for at, at, at a continental level is to reduce the cost of remittances to the continent. Uh, the cost of remittances to Africa is the highest in the world. People don't know that. It costs more to send to Africa than to send to Asia or Latin America. And that has to be tackled at the highest levels uh, of, of, uh, of, of governments. Um, and then locally, um, you know, is, is to treat, um, you know, um, the, the overseas Africans, whether historic or uh, you know, new diasporas, as national citizens, and therefore uh, you know, um, investment opportunities that are given to the domestic population should be accorded to those groups. Because they're already bringing money anyway, and they'll bring even more. Uh, and more importantly, it will be money targeted at investment. There is a little bit that is going on, but a lot of the remittances are for consumption. You know, we all say money to our grandmother, grandmother, uncles, aunts, parents, and all that. But we need money that goes into investment. Now, the, an instrument was just created by the um, uh, by the AU African Union a couple of years ago, I think at the beginning of last year, um, to you know to, to to facilitate diaspora investments through that instrument. Uh, and, and you know, such policy initiatives uh, must be undertaken by national governments, the regional economic communities, as well as at a continental level uh, by the AU, the African Development Bank, uh, and, and the uh, Economic Commission of Africa, and so on and so forth. So those are some of the ways, it seems to me, that we can very intentionally turn this huge capital into a substantive, productive investment uh, capital. Alan, please. Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Solissa, for your brilliant and uh, challenging historical analysis uh, for us. Um, I'm Alan Rush, for Dr. Global Ideas here at Business School. Um, what topic I'd like to come back to and hear your opinion on, uh, as you mentioned briefly in your presentation, that is democracy. Uh, you mentioned something, I think I remember correctly, you said that development democracy has had a rocky start uh, in Africa. I'd like to hear more about the future of democracy in Africa. How important is it? Would it be for future development, especially in a context of, as you described, the polarization between the US and China, when there's, there's a clear distinction of a democratic system and a non democratic system there? And you mentioned also the non alignment of many African uh, nations, communities in that space. So, just wondering how that would work in a polarized democratic and non democratic context. Yeah, that, that's uh, again a very excellent question. And my apologies, I didn't address your China question. So maybe I'll you know, combine it with this. Um, so de democracy is, is deeply rooted uh, in the uh, aspirations of African peoples for a very simple reason. They're faced oppression for a long time, uh, beginning uh, with the, you know, the oppressive condition of slavery, uh, the oppressive condition of colonialism, uh, and so on. So the nationalist movements uh, were very clear that they were fighting for freedom, fighting for the capacity of African peoples to be able to um, control their own affairs and to participate uh, in, the, uh, in those affairs. Now, we know the history uh, that happened, that democratic experiment that you know, was there for the first few years of independence, uh, you know, except for one or two countries, uh, it basically atrophied uh, as a result of military coups and all sorts of other complex forces. And, 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 and those complex forces, and we should not underestimate the fact that post colonial society is a legacy of colonialism. And the post colonial state is, 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 is a state that was constructed uh, in its ideological and structural features by colonialism. And therefore, certain practices were embedded in that state. Now, the Africans began, obviously, to fight again for expanding of democratic space, of associational life, 
and civic participation and so on and so forth. Now, some people, uh, again, you know, the tendency is to always attribute African developments abroad. So people say, oh, you know, the second wave of uh, democratization in Africa is because of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I remember personally, we were involved in fighting about, against the Banda dictatorship long before the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, we didn't wait for the Berlin Wall to fall. Say, oh, okay, let's fight for democracy. No, of course not. We are fighting for democracy all along. And it intensified in the 1980s, uh, precisely because of structural adjustment programs. And of course, um, you know, uh, the, if, as you know, democracy, you can look at it in terms of very sort of uh, optimal forms of democracy and minimal forms of democracy. Uh, you can look at democracy in terms of these political expressions, you know, in terms of voting and all that. But you can also look at it substantively in terms of social economic rights, uh, developmental rights, and solidarity rights, protecting the environment, and so on and so forth. So um, in African debates, the democracy that people are interested in, of course, minimally, they want free and fair elections. But frankly, that's not the full story. They want um, a democracy that is developmental. The creation of the developmental state is a major part of that um, you know, aspiration. And, and the challenge is obviously has to do with all sorts of internal dynamics, the in interest of the political class, because they're quite comfortable with how things are, as well as, of course, in some cases, the interference of other forces and the nature of these movements themselves. They're, they're problematic and sometimes challenging um, in uh, composition and so on and so forth. So democracy, like everywhere else, is going to be a very complex, continuous struggle. Uh, what I did show, and uh, uh, you know, I had forgotten to ask uh, uh, Elena to, to show that, I have uh, some tables on development indicators in Africa as well as uh, democratic indicators. So on the democratic indicators, for example, uh, you find that um, you know, the United States is treated by the economist, uh, and the economist is not a socialist marketer. <laughs> As a flawed democracy, it's not a full democracy. And, and, and when I tell my students that they get what you're not, I say you're not a full democracy. At least according to the economy and other indicators. In other words, the United States cannot go around the world preaching democracy. It needs to take care of its own house in terms of its own democratic um, um, institutions that are, we all know are under threat. Uh, so to take one indicator that is known on the tables, uh, the levels of parliamentary um, involvement of women in African parliament in general, and for some countries specifically, is much, much higher than in the United States. So when you go to Africa and say, um, you know, we want to tell you about democracy, and then someone asks you, how many women are in Congress? When you know, for us, it's more than 30 percent. Sometimes Rwanda is one of the leading countries in the world, more than 50 percent. Uh, so we have to be very careful in the a in what we attribute democracy to, which is always typically homegrown. Uh, President Kaunda used to have a, a very you know, interesting say uh, when answering people who were saying um, the communists are the ones confusing South Africans to fight against apartheid. And Kaunda used to say. You know, the ordinary man, woman, and child in South Africa doesn't need a communist from Moscow, China, uh, to tell them that they are oppressed. They feel it, they experience it, they know it from their daily experiences. So Africans are also feeling it, knowing it, and struggle for democracy on a continuous basis. Uh, the second uh, aspect of vocation, which is very important, uh, is the oh, is China. Um, and, and typically, oh, I'm afraid he left. Uh, typically, there is a tendency to say China is dictatorial, therefore, don't deal with it mm -hmm. because um, somehow we are so weak that uh, you know just smelling the air from China through the trade, we are going to become dictatorial. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between China and Africa is transactional, mm -hmm. just like the relationship between the U.S. and China is transactional. In fact, one of the biggest trading partners of China in the world, even with the trade war, is the United States. 
And nobody says because China is trading with uh, the US, Americans somehow are going to you know, stop having democratic aspirations. China trades with Japan, huge trade. Nobody says Japan is going to be infected by the authoritarian virus from China and stop their democracy. But somehow we think we infantilize Africa uh, to say, if you trade with these bad guys, you're going to become bad yourself. As if, and, and I always tell people, the Africans have gone through colonialism, <coughs> through it, and they've gone through post colonial dictatorships, and they've been fighting against those, and in some cases, they've thrown them. What makes you think that somehow they'll just sit there and say, China, come, oh, you want us to be oppressed again? Oh, welcome. <laughs> one more? Yes, no? one second. No, no, one second. I was just asking Titus, he's my co moderator. Yeah. I've been hogging the show here. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so we have a uh, few minutes left. Yeah. So we can take one more. And I'm going to ask you one to wrap things up. Okay, well, my question or comment. Is not from the standpoint of a scholar, but of someone who's been interested in Africa for decades and have read on my own. And so when you mention ethics, it seems to me that also we've got to have history and we've got to have truth. And so when we look at the development of Africa, we've got to look at it honestly and truthfully. Um, and my studies, um, has set, seen that, you know, especially with the early democracies in Africa, often in the U.S. we worked against it. The West worked against it and overthrew those individuals who were heads of state who were working for the development of their own countries. So I just want to make the point that, and, and also in the U.S., our ignorance is great. Our ignorance of geography is great, but the greatest ignorance is of Africa. And so, and, and that just is not at K through 12, but it's also at universities and people walking around with PhDs and, and so forth. So it seems to me that there is a great challenge. And I think we have to be honest. We have to really be honest. And that's, I'm, I'm of the diaspora, the historic diaspora. Mm -hmm. And I, um, when we were talking about Nkrumah and, and, and many years ago in the 60s. Um, so my question is, or my comment is, all the things that you said in terms of ethics and, and the history is that we have to be honest. And I don't think, I know we haven't been honest. We haven't been honest with the American history, but we haven't been honest with world history. And we haven't been honest in our role in um, Africa's delayed development, the role of the West and the role of the US. And I think if we don't deal with that, honestly, we're still going to have problems. And we're still going to be um, working against Africa. And I, and I think that's that's a great problem, a great problem. And um, as I said, I'm not an African scholar in terms of study in, in the universities, but in terms of my own reading for decades, and that that's a, a great concern. So uh, just to point your answer, I just wanted to give us a room up for where we're going. I'm going to add a little bit to our comments, uh, then you can respond and you said as we wrap up, then we'll have uh, Alan Roos to come and give some concluding remarks. And uh, the comment slash question that I want to overlay uh, with uh, that comment is, is that as I listened to uh, your excellent overview uh, of uh, history of US relations and global relations, globalization, colonialism, and where we are now, one of the things that was really clear to me, and this also goes back to the comments you made about Agora uh, and tracing the, uh, the recent history from uh, Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden. And some of the very clear statements that were made about US 
uh, strategy and uh, goals regarding Africa uh, uh, was very clear that U.S. policy is driven by self-interest. Uh, U.S. is trying to take care of its people, especially in the relationship with China. And so you have two giants that are fighting and the grass is, uh, is suffering for. And the same thing with the Cold War. Uh, so just summarizing uh, your, your uh, uh, lecture today. So my question to you is this. Given that human nature at the very fundamental uh, basis of it all is driving uh, geopolitical uh, policies and decisions, how do you see uh, this changing in the future? And does uh, US universities have a role to play in shaping that? Um, uh, thank you, first of all, for that intervention. Uh, and thank you for uh, the, the summary. So, uh, you know, to your point, I think it's important indeed uh, for African history to be better known. Uh, uh, in, in, in not only in the United States, by the way, but within Africa itself. Um, uh, so it, it actually goes both ways. Uh, and, and, and for up in African schools and universities to know more about the history of the African diaspora. So that uh, you know, they can be much more productive in regions between the continent and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the United States. Um, and, and part of knowing that history is also to understand how the modern world system is managed. Howard French uh, published a book recently, a couple of years ago, called, uh, he, he was a New York uh, Times uh, journalist, now the teacher at Columbia. Uh, the book is called Born in Blackness. It's a fascinating account of the emergence of the modern world system and the central role played by Africa. And of course, we know Du Bois published many decades ago, Africa and the World, again, getting us to understand the world. <coughs> and to your point as to how the development of the global north and the underdevelopment of Africa were mutually constituted, uh, you know, works by uh, Walter Rodney, the great Caribbean historian, uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa, yes. uh, in which he showed how, you know, even the banking system, universities, which, by the way, now we are. We have done enough research to say, oh, what Britain was like. Even the universities were created materially, but also intellectually, out of the, you know, the, 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 the context of the times in which slavery and slave proceeds were important. And Pauline Farola and, and another person just published a book about a year ago, looking at US-Africa relations over the last several centuries from the 1400s, not US, you know, America. Uh, the Americas, and of course the U.S. The specifically over the last five six hundred years. Again, we need to have a long view of history, which shows these relationships did not start with the airlift program from Kenya bringing uh, Barack Obama senior uh, to, to to go to school. Lo and behold, the child of Barack Obama Jr. Uh, that these these connections are very deep. Uh, they've been going on for for a long time. So your point about U.S.-Africa relations, um, the motivations, of course, you know, that's why they're different to uh, to explain that. And, and I, I would say that as a historian, um, you know, a lot of us are more comfortable, uh, you know, looking at the past and crystal gazing into the future. Because one of the things you realize is that, of course, while you can, you know, sort of identify key trends that are taking place, and that's important. Um, you know, predictions of how things are going to happen usually is a full, a full step, right? Uh, you know, if you read things, uh, you know, Time Magazine in the mid 1980s, you know, all these American magazines, foreign affairs and so on, it was assumed the Soviet Union was gonna be there forever. A few years later, that collapsed. And everybody said, oh, how did it happen? Uh, and so I'm, I'm usually suspicious of postulations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one last example of that. Uh, we had a conference at the University of, uh, at the House University of Nova Scotia in 1981. And we were talking about North Africa and the Middle East. And uh, it was a conference of political scientists who do future, you know, futuristic studies. 
and they were talking about all the scenarios. The next day, uh, Amos Sadat was assassinated and changed Egypt's trajectory and the Middle East. Uh, so I'll just say that we know the key trends geopolitically, are economic, are political, they are cultural, they are technological, and that in all these trends, the voice and the participation of Africa is going to grow. And in the growth of that, it will probably be at the expense of the ones that have already been moved. And that's why moments of hegemonic shifts are the most dangerous in world history. The shift from Britain as the supreme power, industrial power in Europe to Germany, we all know, led to the first world war. The hegemonic shift that was occurring in the, you know, following the Great Depression, the World War, uh, and the Great Depression, and so on and so forth. And, and all those forces uh, contributed to some of the developments that you know, went to the, uh, um, you know, to, to the Second World War. What happens historically, however, is that moments of hegemonic shifts pose both opportunities and dangers for the periphery. So the first, um, you know, sort of uh, you know, hegemonic shift of the 19th century created conditions for imperialism, in the new imperialism and the colonization of Africa and Asia and so on. The second uh, hegemonic shift that occurred uh, you know, during the World War period and after created the conditions for the colonization. The question that we have to ask ourselves, the hegemonic shift or rivalry that is now taking place between the United States and China, does that hold the keys for African or something else. And if it's something else, what is that something else? So in my own work, I'm trying to interrogate what these, these global shifts mean for Africa. So I'm, I'm working on a book right now on, on, uh, on, on, on this group, you know, the global political economy and what is happening and how do we read and maybe project the trajectory going to be, at a minimum, very complex. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that whenever you have more questions and you have time to, to answer them, that's always a good thing because it, it, it means that we've had quality uh, conversation. I'm looking at time, so we need to pause. So my apologies to those who may still have questions in the room. For those who have asked questions online, we have not been able to, uh, to have uh, extra time to, to address those. At this point, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Dr. Ali Ruska uh, to come up and give a closing remarks. As you mentioned earlier, he is the director of uh, Global Ideas here at uh, ISA. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Titus, and thank you, Jose, for the invitation. Um, thank you again, uh, Paul, for the wonderful uh, presentation and conversation. So I had uh, originally half an hour to make a presentation that I will reduce in the interest of time to a few minutes. And what I, the me clear message that I want to put out for all of us is that um, among the multiple pathways forward of engagement with MSU, AAP, and other uh, partners um, under the newish U.S. strategy for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, clearly, there are opportunities to amplify what we're currently doing in the international development space with funding, uh, which will be amplified given the new uh, governmental context. So we'll go very quickly to this presentation in the interest of time. So we've heard about the new U.S. strategy for Sub-Saharan Africa, launched in August 2020, and the key uh, strategic objectives um, that has provided the key umbrella for the U.S. government in terms of not just policy, but also funding and engagement with uh, Africa. A second strategy that hasn't been mentioned, but it's also very important for us to understand the context, is the U.S. National Security Strategy, which was launched in October 2020. And if you can read that document, it's public online. Uh, under the chapter of Africa, and this is the key word I want to get back to, and that is partnership. So Africa Alliance Partnership, Partnership, Partnership. Partnership is the title of the uh, chapter under the U.S. National Strategy Policy, 
for the world with Africa. So I just want to make clear that um, this key word of partnership is what I want to drill down to, and I think it's an opportunity for us to expand our partnerships, both with AAP, African universities, and more broadly across MSU. And that's what I want to offer. Of course, that led to the very high level um, meeting the White House. President Biden and Vice President Harris invited over 40 leaders uh, to the US Africa Summit leadership. And again, signaling clear, serious engagement with Africa from the US government position, but also that resulting priority results in uh, funding opportunities for us. And of course, Steve, uh, oh, press release just from last week, last Thursday, in fact, USAID, the implementing partner under the State Department of a lot of this international development work, which MSU, we collaborate, we receive funds from, announced a new policy framework for driving progress beyond programs. This is just on Thursday. And to read down to the third from last line here, fourth from last, uh, second of its key strategies is to embrace new partnerships. So again, I'm just highlighting that keyword partnerships. And of course, as Steve mentioned, his and other attendants at MSU in the US Africa University Partnership Initiative. Again, this was funding from the State Department, the US government clearly looking to engage with uh, African uh, universities, with US universities, and an important signal as well as a concrete step in deepening these partnerships. So here at MSU, um, Global Ideas is very happy to work very closely with AAP, and I want to thank Jose for her leadership for reaching out to Global Ideas and Africa Study Center to work together in a couple of key ways. First, we've worked together in a community practice on uh, equitable partnerships in a statement, and this goes back, I'm sure, Paul, that you engaged in <laughs> some of the original text uh, that was developed here, but we have retaken this uh, up again to try to drive a process that will lead to an agreed text that we can all use across MSU, uh, not just an ISP, but a clear statement of principles and accountability for equitable partnership going forward. This is an ongoing process. If anybody wants to get engaged, just please reach out to us. We can send you the draft and how to be engaged in that process. But the other point I want to drill down to quickly is um, our partnerships on the ground with universities and with countries in Africa. We have a long history that Steve mentioned going back you know, 50 years. Currently, we have over 40 active international development projects in Africa. You can go to the international data portal um, under ISP and find details of that. But clearly, we are engaged in many countries across Africa. Uh, and over 40 projects are going. One newish one is in Malawi, in fact, the Transforming Higher Education Systems, where MSU is working with partners across Malawi at several levels, from a systems level, uh, ministry, government, universities, key universities, and then down to communities to ensure that the relevance of the education is appropriate for uh, Malawi's development. So a really interesting project that MSU has setting up and running along with our partners in Malawi on that transformation. USAID project, $70 million for five years. There are always new opportunities coming out for us, for MSU. One currently on board, a very important one, is the new USAID funding for the YALI Africa Initiative. I think many of you know about YALI in the current uh, uh, phase. They have just announced, or in fact will drop in a few days, uh, the new phase, 2023 to 2028, of this is a youth, young African leaders initiative. It's a flagship US government project funding uh, youth uh, to leadership development across Africa. And the USAID will announce this uh, funding opportunity. MSU were already engaged with this consortium. If anybody wants to learn more about that, please reach out to, to me and see how to be engaged in this new development, new opportunity. So, I have a number of slides here, which I'm just going to leave because you can go to the website and look at them. But basically, Global Ideas, the Unity and SP, we are constructed to do this type of work, again, in partnership with AAP, Gyan, uh, Africa Study Center. But we are here to provide services to partners across MSU and around the world. But just maybe close with this. This is what we try to do with Global Ideas. We look for MSU faculty, researchers, either actively engaged or interested in being engaged in the international development space. We provide four sets of services, community development, funding intelligence, proposal coordination, and program implementation, looking to get some of these outcomes and outputs, such as creation of interdisciplinary research teams and partnerships, successful proposal development, improved local livelihoods and outcome, and scholarly publications uh, during the time. 
Um, I'm going to skip over these in the interest of time, but again, this is what we do. We are here to support the initiative, and I think that this is a real uh, possibility of ongoing collaboration with AAP, Africa Study Center, Gian, across MSU. Identify those of us who want to be engaged, uh, do a little bit of matchmaking with the opportunities that come along. USAID, State Department, and the US government, and there are many others in the foundation and private space. Um, create teams, build partnerships, uh, find an opportunity, do proposal development, make sure we have high quality proposal in the door on time, win it, and begin to implement it so we can make uh, important uh, changes, improvements in university relationships and lives across the world. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And to those who are still online and those here in the room, if you want to engage again with the slides, we will be sending those to you. The, the session was recorded as well, so you can have access to that. Um, we do have some light refreshments in the next room, so don't run away. We want you to, those of you who didn't get to ask your questions, well, those in the room anyway, you can now <laughs> go after him and grab him and ask all the questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.